What are we talking about today uh, primarily? Well, today I'm going to be talking about, of course, the end of the Reconstruction era, which you know doesn't go quite like they, it should have gone, uh, if you know about Reconstruction. Uh, and I'll talk about that. And then we'll start talking about the beginning of the Gilded Age uh, that they have, of course, which that's mostly what they call this period we're in now. Uh, from Reconstruction up to like the 1890s, uh, they often call it the so-called Reconstruction era uh, or Gil in Gilded Age. So um, we've got uh, last last uh, lecture, I think the last thing I talked about was I was kind of getting into like the Ku Klux Klan and all that. And I think that was one of the last things we had done. We talked about the Amnesty Act, the No Enforcement Acts. I think those are some of the last stuff we did. In the 18 so we're kind of getting up to like the end of you know reconstruction and so uh the first thing i need to talk about uh today is i need to get into like what they call the new south i haven't really talked about that term yet uh which is a term they use a lot starting in the 1870s uh in the 1880s uh and uh, it's a term that was coined by coined by henry w grady uh who was actually an atlanta constitution newspaper editor he kind of used the term. It was kind of like the slogan. Some people call it propaganda if you want to as well, but a lot of people call it American slogan that became popular in the late 19th and into the 20th centuries. It was this idea to try to make um, the United States more like an industrialized country uh, like the North is. So that was the whole point of what they were trying to do uh, with that. I have got like a numerous slides on this. Uh, of course, with mostly the, as you know, the whites in control, you know, in, in of course, in, in the South, as you'll see later, because of uh, segregation uh, and all that. And um, so you got the rise of the new South, which uh, they, they wanted to try to create a more diversified South that had not just one crop, which is cotton, you know, uh, which it had for a long time. But they wanted to have other crops, other industries uh, as well. So the whole point was to try to, you know, put other industries in power like coal, iron, tobacco, cotton, lumber, all those together, you know, as one big industries uh, to kind of, you know, industrialize and modernize the South uh, more than anything. Uh, of course, at the time, you know, it was very agrarian. Let me go back to around the Civil War and before that, most of the South was agrarian. Uh, and um, you had some iron starting to develop like around Birmingham in Alabama, uh, as example. And eventually they will get better with textile mills, of course, tobacco already at that point, uh, more or less. Uh, and then over time, they'll try to expand their economy. But if you know much about the South for a long time, it still relied a lot on agriculture, like most of the, I think two thirds or more. Uh, and cotton was still, you know, you know, grown a lot. Uh, you know, of course, partially why was because of the fact that it was like the only crop you could actually make money on. <laughs> it's like a cash crop. The other one's not so much uh, overall. Uh, also, um, you'll see later the type of farming they have to rely a lot on is either tenant farming or sharecropping. Uh, that was because of a shortage of money. So it was kind of difficult to pay people wages because of a lack of money uh, in circulation. Uh, cash in the South. So that was kind of a problem that they had. Also, the rise of segregation, you know, was a big thing uh, in the South, especially after Reconstruction ended. Uh, and you have all these so-called Jim Crow laws that are basically created uh, uh, in the late 1800s, more or less, where everything's segregated uh, up to like the 1950s and 1960s uh, for a long, long time. So yeah, let me get first and talk about, of course, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and talk about segregation because that's one of the, the main things. Actually, I need to talk about sharecropping first. Let's do that first about sharecropping. Yeah, sharecropping was, of course, uh, one of the first things that you start seeing a lot, of course, in the South uh, afterwards. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, they had different kinds of farmers. Like, you know, if you were like a tenant farmer, you were a minority. Uh, there was very few people really uh, that was doing that. Uh, like you could buy land, but of course nobody had any money, uh, which was kind of part of the problem uh, as well. And uh, yeah, majority of people did sharecropping, uh, not just people that are African American, but a lot of whites also did sharecropping as well. Uh, as much as 80% for African Americans uh, in general uh, did it. 
uh, and uh, what's the difference between tenant farming and uh, sharecropping, uh, more or less? Uh, well, sharecropping, um, well, well, first, first tenant farming. Tenant farming is where it basically uh, you were like you rented land, like say from a landowner, and you had to have your own capital. So that meant that you had to have like your own animals to to work the land, buy the seed, whatever kind of equipment you need to farm, basically. And so that's what we call a tenant farmer, uh, pretty much. So it's not like a hired hand or maybe a foreman or something like that, uh, which might just work for somebody for maybe wages or whatever. Uh, and then you have your so-called sharecroppers. And so sharecroppers, basically, you didn't have, you didn't own the land. You didn't have any capital. <laughs> you didn't have anything except labor, uh, pretty much. Uh, and so you basically work the land uh, in, for a share of the crop. And usually you had to give like half half of your crop to the landowner uh, in return, uh, basically. And believe it or not, you weren't paid money for it. You were paid, uh, usually they would pay you these tokens or something like that, uh, where you could go buy something from like the store. Maybe if there was a plantation, you would go buy from the plantation store or a local grocery store, whatever store it is. Uh, and then you would either buy whatever you need or pay off your debts. Uh, and of course, in a lot of cases, a lot of them, you know, they couldn't get a debt. And so it was like a cycle of poverty, really, uh, being a sharecropper. But for a long time, like up to the early, up to the 1900s, um, a lot of people did that. Uh, sharecropping was quite common, more or less. Um, so, yeah, you have all that going on. Uh, by the way, uh, also at the New South, you know, uh, I didn't talk about this. Uh, but um, was I, I kind of kind of skipped it. But yeah, besides you know change in agriculture, there was also a lot of urbanization. So you do have a lot of cities that start sprouting up, like you know, like Nashville, Tennessee, you've heard of, or Rich, Richmond, uh, or Atlanta, Georgia. But most areas of the South were very rural and mostly based on pretty much farming. And you can see where all the farms were and where all the sharecropping was. So areas where you see, I think. Um, where it's, I think, mostly sharecropping the most would be in the blue areas. Uh, so especially see a lot Georgia, South Carolina. You can see how blue that is in those areas. You can see around Louisiana where it's at close to the Mississippi River, about kind of in the eastern part of Louisiana right here, parts of Mississippi as well, Texas as well, you know, in those areas. All right, now I need to also talk about um, how African Americans were also disenfranchised. That's something, of course, you see a lot uh, that happens, of course, uh, in the South, especially as Reconstruction began to end uh, more or less. Uh, so there's different methods of you see those are the main methods, of course, they had, which uh, you can see a lot of those are like the poll tax and literary, literacy tests that they would have uh, overall. So a lot of a lot of states, you know, by the end of especially the 1800s, began to create a lot of these types of laws. Even Louisiana did this, Mississippi, and a bunch of other states in the South uh, as well. Poll tax, you know, was basically a tax to vote, which they used to do, kind of like a head tax, mostly on just men. Uh, and so if you couldn't pay the tax, well, you couldn't vote. That's one thing. Now, also, they had literacy tests that they would have to, they would, like when you go to register to vote, uh, you'd have to be able to read something. And, and it's not somewhere it's like you have to be able to read like, you know, to the sentence or whatever. They would literally make you sit there and say, uh, you know, go ahead and uh, recite the Constitution of the United States of America. <laughs> something crazy like that. And of course, you couldn't do it. And so you couldn't pass. Uh, and uh, if you know, you know what happened, uh, you had whites that were, you know, poor and they couldn't pay the tax. They couldn't read and write and stuff like that. So that's what they call the grandfather clause. You may have heard about that. And so basically what that meant is if your grandfather had voted like before the Civil War, you could vote. So it was kind of something tricky they did with that. Uh, and so a lot of, lot of African-Americans were disenfranchised. Uh, it's happened especially with like in Louisiana with the uh, I think the Louisiana Constitution of 1890. They started you know, disenfranchising a lot of African-Americans uh, as an example of that. Uh, of course, then, of course, the big thing that happened, if you know about this, was, you know, the so-called Jim Crow or segregation laws that were created uh, that separated basically whites from blacks, you know, pretty much. This happened not just in the South. 
Now, they talk about the South, but it happened up, up north, too. They did this as well. A lot of northern states uh, did it as well. It started, like, in trains and things like that. Uh, and then over time, it went to anything public, you know, from restaurants to hotels, bars, bathrooms, water fountains, schools, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, and, um, of course, for a long time, they called a lot of the laws Jim Crow. Like, what was the deal with that? Why do they call them Jim Crow laws? Uh, well, the term Jim Crow evolved from these, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of these minstrels that they used to put on uh, in the South. They call them Jim, they call them, um, they call them Negro minstrels, I think is what they dubbed them. And so you had these white actors that would go around and they'd paint their face black, you know, black face, I think they called it. And they kind of make fun of African-Americans and it's kind of, crew today, but that's that's what they did. You know, it was real popular. And uh, there was a song that was called Jump Jim Crow. I think that was came out in 1828. Uh, and hence the term Jim Crow was basically a nickname for someone who was black, basically. So Jim Black Laws or Negro Laws, whatever you want to call them. Uh, and so that's what it meant, basically. Um, I don't know if you ever been to Saints games. They keep chanting, who dat, who dat, who dat, you know, stuff like that. Who dat going to beat the Saints or whatever. Yeah, actually, a lot of those minstrel shows, they'd actually have actors that would say that. Who dat, uh, who dat, just say who dat or something like that, they would say or something like that. And uh, that's kind of where that came from, a lot of those minstrel shows, uh, more or less. Uh, what gave uh, segregation, of course, teeth? Uh, you're going to see like over time, a lot of states are going to, you know, continuously pass laws like this that segregate, uh, you know, whites from blacks, you know, over time. You can see there's some famous pictures of some of the segregation. Uh, so if you wanted to go to the theater, watch a movie, you know, there was a white theater and they had a black theater. It's kind of weird. Uh, even the military was segregated. Yeah, the military for a long time up to like, I think Truman, President Truman, the military was segregated. You know, between black and white, uh, and so on. Segregated schools uh, for a long. Actually, New Orleans for a while after the Civil War was not. It was integrated, but then they started segregating everything uh, pretty much later. Uh, of course, uh, here's a picture of the minstrel shows I'm talking about, where these actors would, you know, like I said, uh, wear blackface, uh, as you see right there. So that's where it came from, uh, more or less. But yeah, the story of Homer Plessy, that's pretty much one of the reasons why uh, segregation became more um, legal, uh, more or less. You probably heard the story of Homer Plessy. He was actually from New Orleans. And Plessy was this uh, African-American that was only, actually only one-eighth black. He was actually seven-eighth white, uh, believe it or not. And uh, he tried to challenge um, some kind of uh, uh, Louisiana law about segregation on trains uh, where he had like a white train and a colored train uh, they had. It was in 1892. Uh, and when he tried to ride, I think, in the white section, he got arrested. Uh, and so it went to the Louisiana Supreme Court uh, where it was rejected. And then uh, he tried to get it appealed uh, to the Supreme Court in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. And what happened was they ruled against him, uh, saying that, separate but equal facilities was was legal uh, because it didn't really violate the 14th Amendment, uh, they thought uh, at the time. And um, and so so basically that that what Plessy versus Ferguson did was it gave basically segregation teeth is what it did. It made it strong. And so after that, a lot of states started passing more and more of these laws and put it in their constitutions and it became legal uh, pretty much. So that's how it basically got started, uh, pretty much, segregation. But it wasn't just in the South. A lot of people think, you know, it was just in the South and all that. But uh, it was also basically in the North as well. Everything was also segregated, uh, you know, overall. So um, so that's what the whole point was. It's basically separate, equal facilities for everybody. But if you know about it, it wasn't often equal. That's the thing about it. You know, both have these, both have separate schools or whatever, but they're not the money's not being put into the black schools compared to say the white schools. So now the other thing that happened too, which is very famous, you know, about that period. So as everything starts getting segregated, you know, uh, in all that, 
Uh, they've got these two different um, African American leaders that are kind of important in the late 19th century. You've got you know Booker T. Washington, you know, and W. W. B. Du Bois. Uh, both those two, you know, leading voices, and uh, they're kind of critical of each other. If you know about uh, those two men, uh, and um, here's kind of the differences between the two. Uh, you can see Booker T. was actually born a slave. Uh, in Virginia. His mother was a slave. I think his father was actually white, uh, believe it or not, Booker T. Washington. He believed vocational education was important. You ought to get some kind of job skill or something, agriculture or, or some kind of industry. Uh, and so that's why he went to Hampton Institute, which became Hampton Uni University in Virginia uh, today. And of course, Booker T. Washington was very instrumental in starting Tuskegee, uh, which is now a university in Alabama. Uh, and he thought that I think you talk about the gospel of work. It was one of the things that Washington believed. He believed if um, African Americans worked hard, uh, they got you know training and all that, you know skills and all that. That over time they would get gradual equality of whites, uh, and so that's that's what kind of he favored uh, more or less. And uh, but he was kind of unpopular with some African Americans because they thought he didn't go far enough and he should get get more rights. But at the time it was kind of difficult for them to do that you know, in the South, you know, in the 1800s, you know. Uh, now on the right, you've got W.B. Du Bois, who was from Massachusetts, um, of course, never born a slave. Uh, and uh, he was highly educated. I don't know if you know that Du Bois, he went to Harvard. He was the first African-American uh, to get a Ph.D. Uh, and Du Bois believed that uh, African-Americans, if they want to major in anything, even liberal arts, they should be able to do whatever they want, uh, get every kind of skill or whatever, uh, and so he believed that, you know, African-Americans should seek more equality, civil rights uh, in general. Uh, and so his his view of what Washington was doing, he called Washington like an Uncle Tom, you know, well, he was kind of going going about the wrong way. Uh, and both had famous works like uh, Washington had Up From Slavery, it's well known. And then Du Bois has a collection of essays that are well known called The Souls of Black Folk. So both were famous like authors or writers. Uh, as well. So those are kind of the difference between the two, uh, more or less. Uh, and so, yeah, so like he favored vocational education, uh, more or less. Uh, and then he favored more, way more liberal arts. So I think one of the other more liberal arts, I think. And uh, of course, the one thing about Du Bois that is very famous I've got, uh, Du Bois was one of the men that, of course, helped develop the NAACP. That's, that's you know, well known today. Uh, that helped to give African Americans more more you know rights uh, in America, so-called Niagara Movement. It's dubbed, and you know, in that little short video, they talked about how um, I think um, what Booker T. Washington the Atlanta Compromise, where he kind of compromised with whites uh, in general, and so Du Bois thinks that they shouldn't do that; that they should fight you know for more political, civil, social rights uh, as as African Americans. Uh, and so that's something that the uh, Niagara movement was really about, uh, which met first in 1905 at Niagara Falls in New York. Uh, so that's something that's going to be a while. It's going to take, you know, African-Americans a while to get, uh, you know, full full civil rights uh, in general. And it's something you'll see more, especially after like World War II. Uh, you'll, you'll see that more like the 1950s, uh, striving more towards that. But at the time, it was very difficult, you know. You know, in like especially in the rural South, you know, in the 1800s, uh, to do much. Uh, it's going to take a long time for that to kind of come about. Right. So the next thing I need to move on to. So I'm kind of pretty much I'll, I'll get more into what happens with the um, uh, Reconstruction era. It kind of ends, you know, with the 1876 election, which I haven't quite got to, but I'll, I'll get to that next a little bit later. But I first want to start a new period, uh, which kind of comes in which is well known uh, in the uh, late 1800s. And that is the so-called um, so Gilded Age, uh, they call it. It occurs from like 1860s uh, up to like the 1890s. It's a like so-called post-Civil War America. It usually starts under Grant's administration and goes up to like the period of imperialism. And America started to become like a imperial power, uh, more or less. And uh, where does the term come from? Uh, well, the term Gilded Age um, was from, uh, well, I'll kind of first tell you what it is first. Here's the period where it's from, you see there. But 
Uh, uh, you've heard of Mark Twain. I think I mentioned him before. He's a very famous novelist, probably one of the greatest American novelists of all time. Uh, wrote, uh, you know, Huck Finn and all that, Huckleberry Finn. Uh, and um, he wrote a satirical novel called The Gilded Age, uh, which I think was published, I want to say 1873, I think was the year. And it was making fun of like all these speculators and politicians that were kind of taking advantage of the country after the Civil War. They're getting rich and all that. And uh, they're, but they're all corrupt. Uh, and uh, this era was called the Gilded Age, but a lot of people dubbed it the era of good stealings because everybody was using bribery, corruption, graft uh, to make as much money off of what they were doing for a living. So they were a politician. They were trying to make money off of that. Uh, industries were kind of doing unscrupulous you know, means to kind of make money. Uh, and so it's considered one of the most corrupt periods in American history. And it's also known for a lot of corrupt elections, uh, especially the one in 1876, which you know ended Reconstruction early, uh, which it did. Uh, I'll get to it later, but the Gilded Age is also, we'll get to like, I think later in the week, hopefully on I should probably on Thursday get to the talk about the American West and all that. That's part of it as well, because America expands westward towards California, as you know. Rise of industries like capitalism and big business takes off. And they even throw in the imperial period, like new imperialism of America, uh, like we'll take over Cuba and all that. Uh, that's that's basically you know something that um, is part of that period you know, as well. Uh, a lot of the corruption, of course, that happened, you know, in this period happened under Grant's administration. I think I talked about this before about Grant. Here's, of course, a slide uh, if you want to want to see um, Mark Twain right there on the left, left, a picture of him. But a lot of the corruption started under General Grant. Uh, Grant's administration was one of the most corrupt uh, in American history. Uh it was a pattern of corruption you could see both in and outside of politics, not just <laughs> politically in Washington, but like in industries uh, and things like that. Uh, Washington, uh, Grant was really a great general, but a lot of people kind of deem him on the political side of it. He's, he's not as well known for being as good of a politician. I think they usually put him in the middle somewhere as like a kind of a mediocre president. He's not bad, but he's not good <laughs> either. Uh, pretty much. And um, you see a term grantism. That was often a term they used for a lot of the corruption uh, that occurred, which is a pattern which, you know, Senator Charles Sumner uh, kind of talked about, about uh, which plagued his administration. So it happened quite a lot. And so they called it that uh, more or less. Uh, Grant's administration was known for a lot of famous scandals that broke out. Uh, most of them in the 1870s, I think, probably, at least from 1869 to 70s, 76, I think, was the peak of them uh, predominantly. Here's a bunch of them. Uh, they have the Credit Mobile scandal. They have the Whiskey Ring scandal, the Belknap scandal, which they had different names for that one. It was called the Trader Scandal or something like that. They called it Gold Fist, Gold Ring Scandal, I think was another thing. Uh, Boss Tweed, you may have heard about that one, the Boss Tweed Scandal, of course in New York was also big, which was kind of separate from Grant, but it also happened about the same time uh, under him. So I'll kind of talk about some of these scandals that they had, of course. And uh, there was one that happened uh, probably the earliest on, they always talk about, uh, that was well known. And that was the one that was about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. And I don't know if you know much about that one, but the Transcontinental Railroad uh, was part of a uh, act passed by Congress called the Pacific Railway Act, uh, which built a, basically a railroad that would connect the East Coast with the West Coast of the United States, something they'd been trying to develop before the Civil War. Like I think Jefferson Davis had been trying to develop it, supposedly, uh, and um Anyway, um, it created like these two railroads that would eventually build it. Uh, one was called the Union Pacific, and then the other was called the Central Pacific. Uh, the railroad's about, I think, almost 1,800 miles long. And uh, the railroad, um, I'll put it on the screen here, but the railroad went basically from Omaha, Nebraska, where it started, and it would go all the way to Sacramento, California. So it linked up basically the Midwest, California. 
Uh, and um, anyway, yeah, these are the two routes. So you got the Union Pacific uh, and you got the Central Pacific. Uh, the one on the left, the Union Pacific, you know, that one was the more corrupt one, uh, the, the company that built uh, the, I guess, the eastern part of the leg of the railroad. And it, it made a lot of money off of the um, off of the building of the railroad by kind of exaggerating how much the actual building costs were, which is something it's kind of known for. They did complete it, uh, which... That's the wrong date. It was actually completed on May 10th, 1869. Uh, finished, you know, they met at Promontory Point, which is in Utah. That's where it was actually finished, uh, more or less. But they discovered later, uh, a few years later, that in 1872, uh, that there had been a bunch of corruption involved with it, uh, apparently. Uh, and it had to do with this um, this uh, scandal they had, which was called the Credit Mobile Scandal. Uh, that it was often dubbed. Yeah, Credit Mobile. Uh, you may have heard about this. And apparently there was a politician uh, in Congress. His name was um, Oaks Ames. He was from Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, he had this brother that he put in charge of it. Um, it was basically the president of it. And the company was phony. It was a phony company uh, to basically try to, I guess, overcharge the, you know, the government in and. I guess false contracts, uh, more or less. And uh, apparently, what happened was they overcharged the government by about forty-four million. Uh, in fact, it took the actual. It only cost fifty million to actually build uh, the Union Pacific's actual part uh, of the actual transcontinental railroad. Uh, and then they said it cost actually uh, about. Um, I think he said it was like 94 million <laughs> to actually build it. So they basically ripped them off uh, by a bunch of money. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that was one of the guys on the volume, Oaks Ames, uh, who was a politician in, in U.S. Congress, uh, basically involved in it. And uh, they actually think that it wasn't just him. It was other politicians. Like they had actually both of Grant's vice presidents. Uh, actually, they believe it bought stock in this company uh, as well. So, yeah all these politicians uh, that were basically in Congress making money uh, off of this, you know, building of the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, so it became a real big scandal. One of the first, I guess, major scandals you hear about uh, in American history. And uh, some went to prison, but I think some got off, uh, if you know about that uh, at the time. Uh, they also, what they call the Big Four. I don't even heard of them. Uh, they, they, they built the so-called Central Pacific Railroad, uh, they often called themselves the associates. These were four men uh, that were kind of in charge of the construction of the uh, Central Pacific Railroad that ran from Sacramento to Utah. And uh, there was a man you may have heard of named Lee, Leland Stanford. He was the guy that actually was the, the president of the Central Pacific Railroad. He made a fortune uh, building the railroad uh, as well. He was famous for building Stanford University, you've heard of, uh, which is in California now. It's named after him. So that's so-called Credit Mobile uh, scandal. But I guess they got the Transcontinental Railroad, but you, you'll see numerous of these railroads, of course, built later. I think it's like four or five of these Transcontinental Railroads that they eventually build across the through the Midwest and all that. All right, also, there's other scandals they had, too. Like they had the Whiskey Ring uh, that was kind of uh, very famous, and they also had the Salary Grab. That uh, was also another scandal uh, that came about. Uh, that was well known. Uh, the whiskey ring scandal was apparently a deal where a bunch of distillers were not paying their taxes on whiskey <laughs> that they were making. And it was, it was found out by this guy named Benjamin Bristow, who was the Secretary of Treasury, found it out in 1875. It's one of the very few honest guys maybe that must have been in the Treasury. <laughs> and he found there was a network of where they were giving bribes to federal agents or whatever to avoid paying taxes and all that, which I think was like close to like a, something like a million a year they weren't paying or something like that. And apparently the, uh, there was a um, personal secretary of Grant, Orville Babcock. He was actually involved in it. He was actually indicted uh, on charges. He was involved with the whiskey ring, uh, but he was later acquitted because uh, he knew Grant and all that. And Grant kind of got him off and all that. So it obviously paid to kind of know who, who you're connected to and all that at the time. So there's a lot of patronage going on uh, where people could, you know, 
get influence and jobs and things like that uh, based on who they knew uh, and all that. It's called a spoil system and so on. Um, oh, the salary grab was where what happened was the Congress gave basically themselves a 50% raise in March of 1873, which also they actually gave Grant a raise. Like when Grant came in, uh, in his, I think his second term, I believe, he got like a 50% raise. Uh, so did the Supreme Court justice of well, the Supreme Court as well. Uh, this angered everybody, uh, which was later repealed. We weren't, weren't happy about that. Um, and that was kind of a, a, that was really unpopular because if you know about the 1870s, 1870s was not a great time uh, in American history. Uh, during Grant's second term, uh, the so-called Long Depression happened, which lasts like six, seven years, where the United States is in a depression economically. So uh, they also had this scandal with uh, William Belknap. It's called all kinds of names. I think they call it the Trader Post scandal or the Indian Trade scandal. It was called all kinds of things. I know that. And William, William Belknap, Secretary of War, was taking bribes uh, from various traders uh, in Indian territory, which I think was in, it was in Oklahoma is where it was, which I think was almost like $25,000 worth of bribes or so he was getting or something, money on the side. And apparently uh, you've heard of George Armstrong Custard, a uh, very famous war hero, Indian fighter. He turned him in. He sent a bunch of letters uh, that exposed what Belknap was doing. Uh, and it became a big scandal uh, in 1876. Uh, and um, what happened was, if you know about Belknap, Belknap was one of the first, he was one of the first uh, cabinet members to be impeached uh, by, by, by Congress. Uh, House, House representatives impeached him in 1876 and went to eventually to a trial. Uh, and the weird thing was he had actually resigned. And they still kept going with the, with the trial anyway. You saw what happened with Trump. Oh, he got, they still had the trial anyway, right? Uh, same thing happened with that. Uh, but a lot of the um, members of the Senate uh, quitted him because they felt like they couldn't really find him guilty since he had resigned. You know, he was not in power anymore. Uh, so hence, that's the reason for that. So, so uh, yeah, Belknap basically stepped down and all of that. There's Orville Babcock on the left. He was actually up uh, in the Civil War, too, with Grant, which is probably why that was so with that. So, yeah, Belknap right there, a picture of him. Uh, they also had this other scandal, uh, which it's got all kinds of names uh, that occurred. I think they call it the Gold Ring Scandal, I think is one name they call it, or the Gold Corner Market Scandal or something like that was also what they called it as well. Uh, it's about these two uh, Wall Street guys named Jim Fisk and Jay Gould. And uh, what happened was in 1869, they tried the corner of the gold market, uh, like on Wall Street and all that, to control it. And um, they actually tried to wine and dine, <laughs> believe it or not, um, Abel Corbin. He was he, Abel Corbin was actually the brother-in-law of Grant. Uh, he was married to one of Grant's, younger sisters, <laughs> and uh, he was like a, a speculator of some type. And so they were trying to gain like insider trade information about the gold market uh, by using Grant's brother-in-law. It almost worked. It almost worked. Uh, but apparently when the uh, gold ring, uh, I guess, was discovered about what they were trying to do, uh, Grant eventually injected something like $4 million worth of gold into the market from the government. And so the whole attempt to corner the market collapsed is what it did. But if you know what happened, uh, it caused actually what would be called the Panic of 1869, uh, which they think somehow, I think, helps to influence later the, I guess, uh, what would be depression, economic depression that comes later, a few years after that, uh, that comes in. But Fisk and Gold were investigated, but they got off uh, because of the fact there was a lot of corrupt judges you know, in, in uh, state governments uh, that kind of, you know, all connected with each other. And so they, they never were punished for it or anything like that. Uh, then the one, you've probably heard of this one. This is probably considered one of the most famous scandals that happened uh, in American history at the time, which was the Tweed Ring scandal. You've probably heard of that. Uh, that was real famous uh, where Boss Tweed uh, was, was doing a lot of corrupt things uh, also with government, state government at the time. 
What was the Tweed Ring scandal? It was this New York political scandal uh, which involved Marcy Tweed. He was, they called him Boss Tweed. It's a nickname. Uh, and he controlled what they call Tammany Hall. What was Tammany Hall? Tammany Hall was New York City's powerful Democratic political machine. Well, they pretty much controlled everything, not just the, the government, but like the economy uh, in, of New York uh, and so on. And what happened was he and his buddies, uh, they were kind of all in, in together like a ring, uh, basically stole millions of dollars from the, from the New York government and from like taxpayers. And they did this through like, bribery, uh, kickbacks, fraudulent contracts, uh, fixed elections. And uh, Boss Tweed had a lot of power. He would use um, like a lot of his power to like get a lot of the immigrants to vote for him and other candidates. And he would give them like money, jobs in return, uh, things like that. And uh, you may have seen a movie called Gangs of New York. He's kind of a character in there where he even control, he's some of the gangs to kind of of New York to kind of control things uh, and stuff like that. And so he was really a corrupt, corrupt politician. And uh, they're not sure the amount of money that, that they stole. It's kind of been debated about it today, but there's been some claims that they stole anywhere from 30 to $200 million from the New York government. Uh, and later on, it was found out. Uh, I think around 1872, I think they discovered that, uh, one of the accountants, I think, who had like information on, you know, the account books of Tweed and his associates, uh, it was exposed, uh, apparently. Uh, and so there was this guy named Samuel Tilden, uh, who was a politician and lawyer. I mean, she lost, launched a bunch of investigations against, against Tweed. He was an anti-Tammany Democrat. Uh, and Tilden, of course, and other, other Democrats eventually went after Tweed, um, and he was eventually indicted and imprisoned uh, for being involved with this. Although, if you know about Tweed, he actually fled the country and went to Spain. And he had to be extradited and brought back, and he went to prison and died in prison. So, anyway, that was the so-called Tweed ring. And, but a lot of these cities were like that. A lot of these American cities, not just New York, but many of them were very corrupt. St. Louis, Chicago, Boston, you name a city. Uh, there was a lot of corruption uh, that was kind of going on uh, at the time. So I want to, of course, move on. The last thing I want to talk about today is I want to get into, like, politics today and, and, and you know, get into and talk about how, yeah, politics was kind of corrupt, too. Uh, in the late 19th century uh, as well. Uh, and I uh, want to talk about, of course, uh, what happened in 1896, uh, which is uh, pretty big uh, overall. Probably one of the most famous elections that happened in the late 19th century was one that, that happened between these two men you see there, Ralph B. Hayes versus Samuel Tilden, uh, which it's almost like this election they had in 2020. It was kind of almost, almost went to that, seemed like it, uh, overall. And um, so, yeah, uh, Ralph B. Hayes was the governor of Ohio, I believe he was a Republican, yeah, Republican, of course. And then Samuel Tilden was also a Democrat uh, from New York. He was the governor of New York. Um, and Hayes, uh, not Hayes, Tilden was considered like a reformer, uh, pretty much, with the two. And I could kind of blow it up for you right there, but you can see the two uh, right there. And uh, I think originally there was talk of even, you know, running Grant again for a third term, but I think that was pretty much shot down uh, overall. So they, they picked Rutherford Hayes. He was kind of a pretty much a moderate uh, overall and was seen as an honest man. And then you see Tilden there was a big reformer. He had helped to, you know, crack down on corruption in New York City uh, with, you know, Boss Tweed and all that. And so those are the two men that faced off against each other. But what happened was when the election, uh, of course, ended, uh, it was held on you know November 7, 1876, uh, there was a dispute of the electoral votes, kind of like what happened in 2020, I guess. There was some kind of dispute with that, some people said. Uh, and so, yeah, those states right there, Louisiana, Florida, Oregon, South Carolina, had these disputed elections, and there was a debate about, especially the ones in the South, Louisiana, Florida, South Carolina, uh, there was a dispute about, you know, who should get those, Republican versus Democrat. 
And uh, at that time, you know, uh, the, the votes, at least the electoral votes, anyway, was 184 for Tilden. Tilden was in the lead. He only needed one electoral vote. He needed 185 to win. Hayes had 165 electoral votes, so he needed 20 to win, uh, basically. And so controversy became over, like, who should get the votes. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats said they won the elections uh, in those states. Uh, and um, and I, think, I, think, I think the Republicans, you know, uh, felt like the Democrats were trying to stop African-Americans and over voting in a lot of the southern states. I think I'd say it's part of why they think uh, why this happened uh, and all that. And uh, what happened was the Congress came up with this idea. They called it the Electoral Count Act. They called it of 1876, I think it was dubbed. And um, actually 1877, I think it was when it was. And um, what it did was it created a commission to look into who should get the electoral votes. And so what they did was they divided uh, the commission uh, into like 15, 15 feet members of it. Uh, five would come from the House of Representatives, five from the Senate, and five from the Supreme Court. So they picked five men from each one, basically. Uh, what happened was uh, it just so happened that there were eight Republicans and seven Democrats that were on the commission. And you can guess how they voted. Yeah, the eight Republicans voted for Hayes, and the seven Democrats voted for Tilden. And so eight to seven, what ended up happening of course, was that Hayes won the election. He ends up winning uh, because of that. And uh, what happens was, uh, the, the, if you know about it, the Democrats made this compromise with the Republicans that if, hey, if Hayes gets the White House, okay, I want Hayes to remove whatever troops that are left in the South and in Reconstruction. And so uh, what ended up happening, if you know about it, one of the things that was a result of the 1876 election was that the Democrats took back control of the Southern states. So they call, they call themselves redeemers. I think I used that before maybe. And, um, and then of course it led to the disenfranchisement of African-Americans segregated. It was all kind of snowballed afterwards. Of course that happens. Uh, and so that was one of the things that, you know, resulted uh, in, in the end of the reconstruction. So yeah, so reconstruction ended early uh, because of, what happened uh, with this election uh, between these two men. And um, here's another slide, of course, on the compromise of it. Uh, but yeah, so the agreement was that federal troops had to be removed with the start of states ending reconstruction. Uh, and um, they also asked for that, you know, of course, some things and part of the compromise you can see there, uh, Providence agreed to name a Southern, Southern the cabinet. Uh, under Hayes, federal spending on rebuilding the South would be also spent. Uh, of course, would be another thing that they would do uh, besides removing the military from the South, uh, more or less. So that's a consequence, you know, that will obviously uh, be later a problem. You know, it's going to be a long time before they really make enough reforms to the South that betters it. But you can see later that white supremacy is going to be pretty much the norm that controls a lot of the southern states uh, for many years afterwards uh, because of that. Uh, I don't really talk much about Hayes' admitted, but hey, under Hayes, uh, you know, um, Hayes was the 19th, well, he became the next president that came in next uh, overall, you know, the 19th president of the United States. One-term president, uh, only in power until 1881, you can see he was not very popular. So Robert Hayes is not a very popular presidency. Uh, a lot of people made fun of him. They thought he wasn't really uh, should be president. They called him his fraudulency uh, or old eight to seven, I think was another nickname. Uh, they called Robert B. Hayes. And then um, what happened under Hayes was the Republicans split politically uh, into two factions. They had one group called the Stalwarts and the other was called the Half-Breeds. Uh, stalwarts were Republicans. They were old guard Republicans that didn't want to make any reforms. And then the ones that were called half-breeds, half-breed you know, Republicans, were ones that wanted to make reforms in the spoil system uh, and so on, uh, make reforms to politics in general. And so those are the differences that pretty much divided 
uh, the two sides uh, at the time. Uh, examples of ones I'll kind of give you for later, but we'll talk about, uh, of course, these two. Men, you got Chester Author, of course, was an example of a stalwart. Uh, I think I've got a picture of these guys showing the differences between the ones that are uh, reform minded versus, uh, yeah, they are right there, uh, which is uh, on that picture right there. So you got, yeah, the one on the um, far left is Chester Author. Chester Author, of course, will later be. Vice President under James Garfield, who will be president next uh, after that. So he's an example. And he'll be the 21st president because, you know, Garfield gets shot, you know, by that killed, assassinated uh, as an example. I don't know if you have to know about Roscoe Conkling, but he was another one. He was a New York senator and a stalwart, and he opposed civil service reform. He was kind of a rival to uh, Ruff B. Hayes and Garfield uh, as well. So both were all Republican, of course. He controlled the New York Custom House, which is pretty important for trade coming into like New York, you know, and all that you know, important importing goods and all that. And so, and then the guy on the far right, James Blaine, uh, he was a senator, uh, also also Secretary of State uh, Blaine, uh, as well from Maine, and uh, he of course was also a big reformist as well. Actually, ran for president twice in 1880 and 1884, uh, but Blaine was sort of half breed. He was pro reformer uh, and all that. Well, um, of course, what happened was um, Hayes did run for for election. You know, about this in eighteen eighty, and so uh, they had a bunch of new candidates that ran uh, in eighteen eighty. Uh, they had two guys, James Garfield, uh, who was on one side uh, that ran uh, for election. Oh yeah, the other guy, Sam. He's not. Oh, there he's on the bottom right. And then the other guy they ran was uh, Winfield uh, Scott Hancock. It was called Han the Superb. Uh, both were war heroes. Uh, Garfield had fought in the Battle of Shiloh and also Chickamauga, uh, northern Georgia. And if you know about Hancock, he had been a, I think he was a general too. He had fought in the Battle of G Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. He's from Pennsylvania, Hancock. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, um, so those two were kind of opposed to each other. Uh, Garfield, of course, was kind of a dark horse. His running mate was Chester Author, I told you about, would be his VP. Uh, you can see the top uh, the what they ran on. Mostly the in the 1880 election, the big issue was tariffs. Back in the late 19th century, that was the big thing about whether they should raise tariffs or lower tariffs. Uh, the other big thing was like the um, silver thing. You know about silver coining silver or silver money was the other big thing that was a popular political issue in the late late 1800s uh, and all that. But that was one of the other things that was real big. Republicans favored higher tariffs, uh, you know, uh, to protect a lot of the industries. And then the Democrats wanted the lower tariffs, which would help farmers. They could buy stuff, products, especially overseas and things like that. Uh, and so that's, that's the difference between the two different sides uh, that you had. Uh, Garfield, of course, won the election. Uh, you know, electoral votes weren't that bad. I mean, Garfield won that easily, 215 to 155. But you can see there that one thing that was real famous about the 1880 election was that the actual popular vote was one of the closest in American history, like 2,000 votes for under, really. Yeah, that's amazing right there. I don't know if you know about the one between Trump and, you know, Biden. It was like 20,000 votes in like some like three states. That's why Biden won. It was crazy. Uh, I think also the JFK won when JFK won and John F. Kennedy won and gets Nixon in 1960. It was also kind of like that real narrow uh, with the popular vote uh, as well. So, yeah, I guess either one, it could have been swung either way. If I guess it'd be the one at one different states uh, in general like that. Uh, and um, one thing that's famous about the um, 1880 election, if you can show you this map here, uh, you can see here, one thing you start seeing, which is real, real famous, is that you notice that the southern states start voting all Democrat again. Uh, and I don't know if I uh, mentioned this term for that, but they often call that the so-called solid South, uh, which will be like this, I think, up to like the 1960s. Uh, that a lot of the southern states will pretty much vote Democrat 
uh, more or less. Uh, and uh, so that's something you start seeing more and more for a long time. Now, um, let's talk about Garfield. Garfield was not in power uh, very long. Uh, he was like, in fact, he was only, you know about Gar James Garfield, he was only president for about six months. Uh, and if you know about Garfield, he was a, one of the one of the four American presidents that was assassinated. It's not Garfield, by the way. That's the assassin that shot Garfield, <laughs> which we'll talk about in a second. So he's like one of uh, yeah one of only uh, four presidents to be assassinated. It's probably the one that's the least known uh, out of the different assassinations uh, overall. And uh, apparently he was shot by this man named Charles Gateau, uh, who, by the way, uh, was a um, he was this uh, writer. Uh, he was like a writer mostly. Uh, he was, I think, a lawyer or something like that. And he wanted to be a diplomat and be sent to like somewhere in Europe. Uh, and so he was trying to get a job with Garfield's government. Uh, and I guess when Garfield wouldn't give him an appointment or whatever, he decided to go and shoot the guy. Uh, and so apparently what happened was on the date of July 2nd, 1881, he went to the uh, Washington, uh, D.C.'s like main train station, and Garfield was going on a vacation, uh, leaving Washington. And so he was waiting for the train. And so as, as he was waiting, uh, uh, Charles Gateau walked up to him and shot him twice. I think one in the arm and one in the back, uh, basically. But he didn't fatally shoot him. He didn't die uh, right right afterwards. And uh, a lot of people think that uh, Charles Guiteau was was insane. Uh, but, but he actually tried. To, I don't know if you know this, but he actually, well, in his trial, he tried to plead temporary insanity. Like it was one of the first trials where he actually tried to do that, uh, more or less. And uh, but later he would be convicted, and of course you know, executed for it. Uh, and, uh, but Garfield would for like two months struggled, uh, pretty much because of medical reasons. They think it was all due to his doctors. His doctors, uh, evidently had, had not used, uh, you know, correct medical procedures and could, you know, back in those days, they just pretty much just didn't wash their hands or, or anything like that. And so his wound, his wound got basically, uh, infected. They couldn't find the bullet that was buried inside him somewhere. And so on September, in September 1881, he died from complications, uh, basically. So that's how Chester Arthur becomes president, 21st president of the United States, uh, of course, because of afterwards of Garfield getting shot. Uh, Guiteau, it, uh, by the way, be hanged on June 30th, uh, 1882. That's when he was uh, executed. And uh, they've actually made plays, and, and there's actually a song or something, the Charles Guiteau song or something, or folk song or something like that, that was kind of popular. It was made from that, of course, later. Uh, why was Garfield's assassination important? Well, apparently Garfield's assassination led to a bunch of reforms afterward. There's some interesting facts about Garfield, if you want to look at that, uh, which is right there. But basically, because of... Uh, him getting shot, um, it led to a bunch of reforms afterwards. And, of course, the big thing that happened was the so-called Pendleton Civil Service Act came out afterwards, a Reform Act in 1883. And they believe this was one of the main acts that helped to end what they call the spoil system uh, in federal government. Uh, and uh, before that, you know, you could get, like, basically a job if you knew, like, a politician. They call it patron the patronage system. Uh, more or less. And so after that, uh, a lot of the jobs in the federal government, if you wanted to get it, it was all based on merit. Uh, and they had like this deal where um, you had to take civil service exams uh, to actually, if you ever applied for a civil service job, you have to have some kind of exam that you have to pass uh, before they can even interview you uh, and all that. And so the Civil Service Commission was created from that afterwards. Uh, and so that that kind of also helped to basically prevent a lot of the spoil system uh, from going on. Also, if you're a federal employee, you cannot give money to politicians like running for campaigns or whatever. 
Uh, and so that's something else you see today. And a lot of state governments, local governments uh, also as well. Like I can't give any money uh, to campaigns uh, because I'm basically like a kind of like a state employee, uh, more or less. So uh, also another thing that happened too, because of the, I think I've got some slides on these if you want to look at them later uh, that I've got. Uh, but um, so yeah, yeah, the Pendleton Act, I think is what they usually called it uh, for short, uh, more or less, uh, that was part of it. They also had the uh, so-called Presidential Secession Act of 1886. That was something else uh, that was also created too as well. What it did was it created an order of secession, like if the president and vice president got killed, uh, more or less, he would decide who would become president. And so what they did was they, they decided there would be an order of the cabinet positions that had been created back in the beginning of the republic. And so uh, after the president and vice president died, the secretary of state would come next, then the secretary of treasury, secretary of war, uh, and so on. Yeah, the order. Uh, of course, today, that's not long, no longer in that order uh, anymore. Uh, they do have another act that, that basically succeeded that one, Presidential Act, Presidential Secession Act, Secession act of 1947. Uh, that one, of course, that's the order now. So if the president, vice president dies, for some reason, Speaker of House become president, president pro temper of the Senate, then the Secretary of State uh, then after that, the Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense, uh, and so on. Uh, I want to talk about one other election that was also famous, uh, that was kind of corrupt and kind of also kind of mudslinging, which was kind of well known. Uh, and that was the 1884 election uh, that occurred. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty famous one. In fact, it's one of the most mudslinging elections probably in American history uh, that you can really think of. Uh, that occurred. And um, it was between these two men, which were James Blaine, of course, from Maine, who I talked about before, Secretary of State and Senator. Uh, and then yet yeah, Grover Cleveland, who was the governor, of, I think governor of New York at one point uh, as well. He was the other one, of course, that also was involved uh, in this election. And um, what happened was uh, they found out that James Blaine was kind of corrupt uh, more or less. I talk about graft and all that and corruption, you know, politicians taking bribes and uh, things like that. And apparently some of the Republicans who were more reformers, you know, like those half-breeds, didn't like the idea of Blaine being too cozy with like big business and things like that. Uh, and so uh, he alienated a lot of those guys and all the reformist Republicans who were called mugwumps decided they were going to back Grover Cleveland. Kind of like the uh, what was the 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 ones that didn't like Trump? What do they call them? The, the uh, non-Trumpers, whatever they called them, they so that that supported you know uh, Biden or something like that. It's kind of like the same thing with the with the mugwumps, uh, basically. Oh, and then the other thing that happened, they like Blaine because Blaine was kind of like some of the men under him uh, didn't like certain immigrants, like Catholic Irish and stuff like that. And so that that, that made all the Irish and stuff vote for Grover Cleveland uh, as we started switching parties. Uh, because of that. In fact, there was some deal where one of the, uh, there was some politician or somebody under uh, Blaine said that the Democratic Party was the party of rum, Romanism, rebellion. Uh, and Blaine would repudiate whatever some other guy said. Uh, and so um, that hurt Blaine as well uh, when he ran for, for president. Uh, and so that was kind of a problem. Uh, however, what happened was the, um, Republicans tried to counter about, if you know about what happened with uh, Grover Cleveland. I don't know if you know about Grover Cleveland, but he was a bachelor uh, at the time when he was running running for power uh, uh, for president. Uh, and um, apparently he had had this deal where he had followed a child out of wedlock, which at the time that was kind of controversial. Now it's like, who cares, I guess, today. And so the uh, Republicans made this ditty up that was called, Ma, Ma, Where's My Pa? Uh, that's what they said uh, about about Grover Cleveland. And of course, when Cleveland won the election later, uh, the Democrats later said, "Ma, ma, where's my pa? He's going to the White House." Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so, but anyway, so yeah, but Grover Cleveland would win win that election. And uh, the one thing about Grover Cleveland that's interesting, 
course, 22nd president of the United States. Uh, he, of course, would be the first uh, Democrat elected to the presidency uh, like in 28 years since uh, James Buchanan, 1856. So it's been a long time since, of course, the Democrats have controlled, of course, the White House. Uh, yeah, those are some of the things that Cleveland was, of course, known about. A lot of people call him Grover the Good because he was this um, reformer who's like a mugwump type reformer um, or half breed, if you want to call him as well. Cleveland was known for vetoing a lot of bills. I think they say he vetoed, I forget how many it was, some ridiculous amount of bills, that the most in American history of any president uh, ever uh, overall. Yeah, so he's very famous for that. Um, so very, very conservative physically. In fact, I, I think under his actual, his first term anyway, uh, they actually had surplus, uh, which is amazing uh, for that time. Uh, they say, kind of wish they had now <laughs> more than anything. And um, you can see some other things he did too, uh, which are right there. I'll get to those later, uh, but... Uh, he was known for uh, passing the Dawes Act, Interstate, Com Interstate Commerce Act. Those are things that he helped to do uh, under him, which a lot of those later will be uh, various acts that will basically regulate like Indian affairs and interstate commerce uh, in, in the country, like regulate railroads and things like that, which I won't talk about that now, but I'll get that uh, done later. He was known for lowering tariffs. Uh, that's something that he did do, uh, which was famous. And uh, it became like also the main issue in the 1888 election. If you know what happened in the 1888 election, he lost to Benjamin Harrison. Uh, Harrison was a Republican from Indiana, uh, the actual grandson of William Henry Harrison, you may have heard of, who didn't serve long. He died after, I think, one month in office or less than that. Uh, and... Um, the tariff issue was the big thing in that election, of course. And it's why he lost, apparently, uh, with that. Uh, but one thing about Grover Cleveland, which is very famous about him, I don't know if you know much about this, but Cleveland served two terms. Uh, he later came back uh, in 1892 and defeated Benjamin Harrison. Um, you know, and um, he's, he's like the only president to serve two terms out of out of out of uh, succession, uh, it's something he's kind of famous for. I don't know if he may ever do that again, but that's something he's well known for. Uh, one more thing, I guess I'm almost finished today. I want to talk about a few other things about uh, that's famous at that time that I did want to mention about. I don't think I'd really talk about too much politics after that 1888 election right there, but I did want to mention about. Um, there's one thing about um, Benjamin Harrison, which is very famous about his presidency uh, in the late 1880s. Uh, he was part of a period which is called the Billion Dollar Congress. It's like one of the first Congresses where basically they start spending a lot of money, like a billion dollars uh, or more. Uh, and uh, you can see it spent on a lot of things. And um, they, of course, raised tariffs. That was one thing they did uh, under Benjamin Harrison. I'll get to it in a second. They increased a lot of Civil War pensions uh, as well uh, under him. Uh, I'll get to the Sherman Silver Purchase Act and all that. That's like a big thing. Like the, the idea to, to have more silver is a big thing in the late 1800s because a lot of black farmers and other, or other people thought they ought to coin more silver uh, in general uh, as well. And... Um, yeah, that's a big thing that was like big in the late 19th century. You start seeing all these uh, pensions uh, that they start pushing, like the Pension Act of 1890 uh, was something big uh, that occurred where a lot of Civil War veterans, uh, like in the Union Army, were trying to get pensions for either themselves or their, their spouses uh, in general. And uh, that's why uh, I think that was the other reason why Cleveland was unpopular, because he kept trying to veto that. You know, there was a lot of veterans that didn't like that uh, too much. And so that's what caused like all these fraternal organizations may occur, the like Grand Army of the Republic, Sons of the Confederate Veterans, United Daughters of the Confederates, and things like that were all created uh, to basically get pensions uh, more or less uh, for themselves uh, and maybe for their spouse or children uh, and all that. 
Uh, and also it led to a lot of like, you know, not just pension grabs, but, you know, they also started building like statues and memorials, you know, to honor uh, all these different, you know, veterans uh, and so on. And that's why you have all these statues later. I know they talk about white supremacy as the reason for why they build all these statues, uh, like from the Civil War and all that. But a lot of it was because the veterans were still alive at the time. A lot of them were, like even up to the 1880s and 90s, a lot of Civil War veterans were, were pretty much still around uh, and all that. And they were trying to you know, honor them and so on. So uh, that's why all that kind of happened uh, at the time. But I'm going to get, I'm going to get more into like uh, later politics. I, I won't get like too much into that, that time period. I think when I get to like 1892, 96, I'll get more into like the time when William McKinley Kinley comes in. We'll, we'll talk about that. That's kind of a controversial period uh, because of the silver issue and all that. But uh, I'll be focusing more later uh, in the week and next week, uh, talking about the old West uh, in general. So the development of that in the American West, uh, then next week, I know I'll be getting into also the talk about the rise of industry, like big business, uh, general like that. I know this is a little, a little longer lecture, but I need to get that in today because, like I said, on Thursday, I'm going to move on to talk about the Old West uh, overall. So before I go today, I uh, just want to remind you, don't forget, uh, I do have um, like that reconstruction quiz uh, y'all need to start working on, uh, which will be due next week, uh, more or less. And uh, by the way, if anybody still has like a topic for their research paper, let me know uh, about that. Uh, but uh, overall, um, if you have any questions about uh, this lecture, you know, let me know. Um, you know, you can pretty much send me any kind of comment, question about the lecture. Remember, you do get bonus points uh, for that. Uh, and um, I think that's it for today, uh, pretty much. So I will see you on Thursday. Uh, which, which I'll be, like I said, talking about the uh, Old West. So y'all take care. Have a great rest of the week.